I'm Dietrich Klinghardt. I'm a medical doctor. Um, I received my training in West Germany and as a young doctor already moved to the US because I love the United States. I passed my test here and I've been licensed here since 1983 and I've been practicing here really since then but I go regularly back to Europe to both teach there and to learn what's new over there and so I'm being like a dual agent, you know, bringing things that I learn here back to Europe and things that I learn in Europe back to here. And uh, I have a practice in Seattle uh, that specializes in the treatment of chronic illness. And uh, we sort of slowly moved up our ranks, me and the doctors that work with me. Uh, the average patient that we have has seen 23 other physicians before they've seen us. You know, so we have, we're sort of like, uh, if, you, if you want, like a late stage of the journey that patients are on after they've maybe failed or have given up on other treatment modalities. And so in, in that position, we sort of were also forced to look deeply into the causes of illness. And the main thing that we discovered is that illness is not a static thing that the foundational causes of illness are now quite different from what they were 30 years ago or 35 years ago or 40 years ago. I graduated uh, in 1975 from medical school and none of the things I've learned in medical school have prepared me for what we see now in the medical practice. I teach a lot of medical students that come through my practice both from naturopathic schools and from traditional medical schools and osteopathic medical schools and I am aware that the teaching in the medical schools to a large degree is lagging behind the evolution of illness. <laughs> um, like when I graduated from medical school we didn't have a single lecture uh, in those five and a half years on chronic fatigue or on chronic pain all the lectures were on acute pneumonia, on rare fatty acid disorders, which we never will see in our whole life as a physician. But the things that we encounter now every day, we didn't have a single lecture on. And unfortunately, that hasn't changed <laughs> very much uh, since then. So uh, I want to just, uh, from the beginning, kind of say from a medical perspective, you know, there's kind of two kinds of illnesses. There's the illnesses that have a name, the traditional illnesses like diabetes or hypertension. Uh, there is fractures and there's appendicitis. And then there is the l much larger amount of illnesses that really go without a name, where the people feel they've lost their zest, they've lost their enthusiasm, they've lost their sex drive, uh, they've lost their joy, they don't dance anymore, they don't sing anymore, they're still living but they're living sort of like a half-life. And our experience, of course, with the patients that we see is that every patient that we see is in that category. Um, I, the main symptom, uh, if I would put it in two words, is loss of zest. You know, so the, it's not that people are suicidal, they just have lost the vibrancy of life, the color, the smells, the excitement, the sensuality of it. And we see that everywhere where we look, we see the same picture. I, I visit a lot of other colleagues and other practices, both here in the US, Canada, and in, in Europe, and see the same picture there. And so we, over the years, tried to distill down what is it really that has changed in illness and what is causing this strange state that we're in, that we're observing worldwide. And we really were able to distill it down to just a few factors. The main one being people have increasing numbers of chronic infections. We don't see the acute pneumonia very often or the acute staph infection. Yeah, those exist. They usually end up in the hospital and the hospitals are doing a good job with the acute stuff. But chronic infections are even denied by the medical community that there exists chronic Lyme disease, chronic mycoplasma infections, chronic Epstein-Barr infections. They're given sort of like a side, they're sort of like a sideline in the teaching and the 
uh, medical community and are not giving their true place because they seem to be active in almost everybody that we see. Chronic mold uh, infection, chronic parasite infestation, those things have been extremely rare when I graduated from medical school and now it's our everyday uh, discovery in our patients are chronically ill that they have these things. And so when we look deeper, what is it that has changed in the last 15, 20 years that these chronic infections have become so prevalent? <clears throat> and what we discovered is very simple. It's the exposure to electromagnetic fields. The only, only thing that parallels the, the exponential increase in, <clears throat> in chronic neurological illness, you know, with the low-grade depression, the, the insomnia, the muscle aches and pains, and the, the fatigue, and the strange neurological symptoms with tingling, numbness, vibration in the body, the only, that, that increases exponentially. The number of children to be diagnosed autistic doubles every five years now. There's no more an issue, well, I'll be over-diagnosing it, no, it doubles every five years. The only thing that parallels that increase is the increased exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields, largely in the high-frequency range. There are some exceptions that have also increased, but largely is the high-frequency range from cell phone radiation, from the Tetra network that the police and other systems are using. Uh, the smart meters are the worst invention that, that we followed in the last two years. Uh, there's absolutely devastating consequences that I will share with you. Um, the only development that parallels the exponential increase that we observe in neurological disease is the exponential increase in exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields. So as a, as a scientist, we don't have to look very far, but neurological disease, Parkinson's, MS, ALS, autism, learning disabilities in children, behavioral problem in children, that's all exploding exponentially. And the only thing that fits from an environmental perspective and from an uh, epidemiological perspective is that this is the electromagnetic waves that are penetrating our body that are responsible for this. And fortunately enough, we have good science now over the past 80 years, more than 6,000 research studies have been published on the biological effects of electromagnetic radiation. The majority of these studies have shown biological damage being done. Of the many more recent advances in research, one notable study was published earlier this year by the University of Athens. The results over an eight-month period showed 143 proteins in the mammalian brain were altered after exposure to either a mobile phone or a decked phone base including proteins which have already been linked to Alzheimer's, glioblastoma, stress, and metabolism. Lead author Adamantia Frajipolu states, This study is anticipated to throw light in the understanding of health effects like headaches, dizziness, sleep disorders, memory disorders, brain tumors, all of them related to the function of the altered brain proteins. This permanently destroys and alters the manufacturing of these proteins meaning it completely changes the human organism permanently. The DNA inside the cell is a, a booklet, an instruction booklet, how to make proteins. And we have about 120 to 200,000 different proteins that are in the cell or in the cell wall. The receptors, you know, how the cell wall communicates with the outside environment is through proteins and inside the cell the manufacturing that each cell does of, of antibodies, of uh, neuropeptides, of hormones, of cholesterol, of building blocks that the body needs to replace, used up body parts, that's all done by proteins. Even the physical structure of your body changes. We've seen a host of people that had normal body weight for 40 years or 50 years and suddenly their weight exploded when the phone company put up the cell phone tower 200 yards from their house, not even that close, 300 yards from their house. Um, we've seen uh, cancer rates shoot up the moment the, the network of cell phone towers was established in the house. Uh, we had a, a co-worker with us, 
uh, who had a son who was very, very sensitive to electromagnetic fields, and she lived here in Seattle, and he couldn't go to school because the schools at the time already had wireless uh, installed in the schools, and he couldn't tolerate it. So she, she moved to Portland uh, and then couldn't tolerate it there at all. <laughs> then moved over to Ashland, which claims itself to be one of the greenest cities in the world. And then when she Googled the cell phone towers next to the home that she had rented, she found that within 200 yards, she had over 90 cell phone installations that were broadcasting <laughs> into her home. And her son was virtually going nuts. And then she moved out in the country, decided on homeschooling, and the boy has been doing well ever since. So after observing like some very uh, sort of very clear-cut uh, clinical situations where people were affected by the nearby, nearby cell phone tower, we became very meticulous in asking people about their homes and uh, looking at the literature. I got uh, certified in building biology, which is the sort of science in Germany that governs uh, these issues where we learn how to use different instruments to measure these phenomena in the house. And the first thing that we noticed is that the most important time in the day when we are vulnerable to the influence of incoming cell phone radiation is the night time, when the parasympathetic nervous system is active and the sympathetics are withdrawing. That's when the damage is done, most of the damage is done. And so we moved very quickly in telling all our patients a set of instructions. So our patients have to turn off all the fuses at night that decreases a phenomenon called body voltage. And I think I don't have to go into that. It's probably explained in another part of the video. We have people have to get rid of their cordless phones because you know, the cordless phones broadcast a signal 24 hours a day uh, into the rooms wherever the person can walk and have reception. That is a very devastating radiation that was also tested in this Greek study that I just mentioned. It destroys the same number of proteins that the incoming cell phone radiation does from the outside, the cordless phone at home. So since six or seven years, my patients are not allowed to have a cordless phone in the house. They have to go to Radio Shack, spend $25 for a corded phone, and that solves it. Then the last step that we do, that every patient gets to measure with the instrument from gigahertz solutions that we use, measure the density of microwave radiation in the bed location. You know, that's measured in microwatts per square meter. And if that number, for me, if the number is over five, it's an unacceptable sleeping location. First of all, we look in the house, if you find a location, there's eddies, we call it, there's turbulences uh, created in the house where often you find a location where the reading is low. If you don't, the person need to use protection in the house. And there's two ways of doing that. One is, is a wall paint that contains graphite fiber, carbon fiber, and conductive particles that creates a Faraday cage in, in the bedroom. It's a pitch black paint that's put over other paint, uh, and over that you can paint normal paint, and then that paint itself has to be grounded with a wire into the earth. And the windows are covered with curtains uh, that use a, a silver-coated cloth uh, that reflects the incoming cell phone radiation to the outside. Now, with that in general, it's, it's possible. Uh, every place that we've looked at so far to bring the radiation down to the level where it's acceptable. Now, I want to roll this forward to, to the clinical picture. I, uh, half my practice is the treatment of autistic children. And we realized very quickly when we did this that there's two kinds of autistic kids, the ones that recover and the ones that don't recover. And the ones that recover are the ones that follow exactly this set of instructions. It is hardly done with the vitamins and with the other things that we do, uh, with the behavioral therapies. They have a minor effect on it. The moment we protect the sleeping location of the child, the autistic children are recovering. Now, I can say that very, with great levels of certainty now for two reasons. One, because I have a large group of people that follow my teaching in Europe, and the Europeans, when they hear that, they get the idea and run with it. In America, unfortunately, especially the husbands have become a huge obstacle to this. 
Most American men <clears throat> never had more than one year of physics in school and simply do not have the understanding, but they have strong opinions without ever having understood physics. They have strong opinions about it that this possibly cannot be true because if it would be true and dangerous, the government would have done something. Well, you make your, up, your own opinion after watching this, uh, this film. So what we did then is a study where we took 10 autistic children and went back to the sleeping location where the mother was when she was pregnant with that child and compared it with the sleeping location of a mother that gave birth to healthy children. We had 10 mothers in that group, 10 mothers in this group, and in the group of the autistic children, we found that the, the measurements that we got for the microwave exposure in the sleeping location of the, where the mother was when she was pregnant with her child was elevated compared to the group of children uh, that were normal. The same measurement we got by measuring body voltage, this is the exposure just to the ambient field, electric field in the home created by the electric wires on the wall, found the same number that the, uh, uh, that the exposure, that the, the electric charge that is built up in the body was by the factor of 10 times more uh, in the sleeping location where the mother was sleeping when she was pregnant with her child. And with that, the exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields has become the, become the first factor that could be isolated ever in autism that could predict autism. I can go to the home of a pregnant mother now, take those measurements and give her a reasonable assessment what her chances are to give birth to a child that will later be diagnosed as autistic. Now, as you can imagine, I was not able to publish the study. Nobody was interested. It was 10 children was too small a group to uh, say something, even though the, the differences are so dramatic that even the 10 children led to a huge statistical difference. But I wasn't able to publish it uh, because of the special interests that are now have found their way into the medical journals and the, the peer-reviewed journals. Um, I think it's important to say that now the uh, communications industry has become the largest lobbying industry uh, in, in politics, larger than Big Pharma. In fact, by a by factor of three times more powerful than the pharmaceutical industry, which used to be the most powerful arm, bending the decisions in Washington and in all Western governments for their purpose. So we weren't surprised when I wasn't able to publish uh, this data, but it made us even more uh, aware of the fact that we need uh, what is called uh, preconception health care. If somebody is planning on becoming pregnant, moms and dads need to know this information that they have to protect the sleeping location of the mother from these fields that are absolutely tweaking the epigenome and the genes of the fetus that grows in there, predicting that this child will never reach its true genetic potential later in life because these early exposures. So one of the points I'm trying to make here is if a fetus is exposed to microwave from cell phone radiation or from ambient man-made fields in the house, the fetus is affected by a factor of hundreds times stronger than a grown-up, fully grown-up brain, even though it's not harmless for the grown-up brain, but the damage is somewhat contained. So we have what I call nighttime technologies to protect people, which is the most important time. At nighttime, all the fuses have to be off. That means those fuses also switch off, the breaker switch also switches off the wireless internet, it switches off all telephone support systems, it switches off your alarm systems, which are equally bad, it switches off everything, every appliance inside the house, it probably does not switch off the smart meter. You know, we've had some smart meters that were on the same electric system that you could actually switch off with the fuses and others you couldn't. That's at night time, you also need the protection from the incoming cell phone radiation. And 
for my patients, we do the earthing pad where we carefully test out where we earthing, where we earthing it, where we grounding the wire that comes off that. So that's the most important part for the nighttime. Now then there is daytime technologies. Admittedly at daytime, most people need the electric system on. So the first thing that we do, we use the Stetsa filters, which have been shown to be effective biologically, that there is less biological stress in the people that are in a room that has the Stetsa filters in the outlets. You know, Stetsa filters reduce the dirty electricity. I know Graham Stetsa has gotten a lot of opposition from that, but Mark de Havas, professor in Canada, has shown very clearly that the Stetsa filter reduce the biological damage that the fields are doing to us. Now, during the daytime, it is not allowed to have cordless phones in the house. That frequency, just to kind of make that point maybe clearer, a German mathematician has calculated the energy delivery. When you have two rooms over, you have the little base station for the cordless phone with a little antenna, and you go in the bedroom two rooms away. The field strength that you're getting when you're sleeping there is equivalent as if you had a 737 Boeing jet engine running at full speed next to your pillow next to you. The sound and the energetics of it are the same as if you have a silent, quiet, cordless phone in the kitchen. It's absolutely destructive to the human health and probably amongst all the things they'll be discussing, the smart meter is number one now in terms of devastation to our system, but the cordless phone is number two. It's worse than the incoming cell phone uh, tower radiation. And so daytime technology, people are not allowed to have wireless internet in the house. It is a huge source of electropollution and of high frequency fields. Uh, they're not allowed to have a cordless phone. Um, we, we paying careful attention now to the energy saving light bulbs. They also give off uh, high frequency radiation that's devastating to the health. So my patients have to go back to use the traditional uh, incandescent light bulbs which are now available on the internet as heat lamps. But they're the same light bulbs that just become instantly more expensive because they're now a rare item. Or they have to pay more money and get LED lights uh, into the house. But the the, uh, as a daytime technology, the new energy-saving light bulbs, the, the compact fluorescent lights, are uh, a completely unacceptable technology. It gives up both high-frequency wavelengths that are devastating to the brain, plus it's mercury vapor-based, and the frequency of mercury piggybacks on the light and makes people toxic and mobilizes toxins in the body that are then swishing around uh, finding, you know, the body stores mercury and other toxins in places where it causes the least damage. The uh, compact fluorescents stir that up and uh, the mercury gets displaced now into the brain, into the spinal cord, into the hormone producing glands and it's devastating. So daytime technology, no wireless inside the house, go back to broadband, no cordless phones, go back to corded phones or there is, yes, there is one type of phone that you can buy that is innocent, it's just much more expensive. Yeah. And no compact fluorescent lights in the house. It's a good start for most people. And then the smart meters came along. Now, let me talk about the smart meter. The smart meters uh, are sold to us with the idea that uh, the electric companies can feed back to us uh, what rooms in our house and what instruments in our house are using excessive energy and that the company will make some suggestions how to moderate our electric consumption so that our home is more green. It doesn't contribute to the use of electricity so much. That's what is being sold to us. But in fact, what we're getting when we have a smart meter on the house is a report that shows, yes, three days ago you used that much electricity, period. The electric company can tinker with the data that it's collecting and actually find out, oh, look, you know, that every Tuesday and every Thursday uh, they have an electronic babysitter because nobody is at home. 
to sit the baby, they can figure out how much your TV is using, they can see the signature in the frequency pattern that is there, and they can, and they're actually selling those data to the community, to, to advertisements. So it's a business. You know, it's a business that does not serve currently the way it's practiced at all the reduction of energy usage. Now, the smart meter sends an impulse, microwave impulse at 900 megahertz, um, between 17,000 and 190,000 times a day through your home, through the entire home. And that radiation can be over 600 fold, we measured it, of the even by the EPA, the EPA set standards of what's acceptable, and these standards are way, way too high for our biological health. And we measured homes where it was up to 600 times above the standards that are set, which are way too high to start with, 600 fold. So uh, what, what happens with the smart meters, there is a router that sends the information back to the electric companies. And whoever has their home closest to the router, that smart meter becomes a transmitter for the smart meters that are further away. And that smart meter then becomes the source of much, much increased radiation, microwave radiation that goes into the home that is sitting on uh, at levels that we measured that were up to 600 times higher than even the high level that the EPA sets as acceptable. And here's what we've seen. One of my patients, a good friend of us, um, had a husband with uh, Parkinson's disease who was doing okay for many years. The smart meter was installed. Within weeks, the patient has a dramatic downturn in brain function. He was no longer able to walk. And six months later, he died. My patient, who had recovered from Lyme disease 10 years ago and was in very stable, good health, the moment a smart meter was installed, her health went down and she can no longer sleep any night. She has a constant feeling of vibration in the body. She feels that like she's losing her mind and she had to evacuate her home to save her life. She moved back in with family members. She has a beautiful home here in Mercer Island in Seattle in the richest, wealthiest area in a home that she can no longer live since the smart meter is there. Now we're trying, me as a physician, I try to explain to the electric company that, uh, you know, that they're destroying the health of the patient. The electric company, of course, tells us, well, there is no laws overseeing the electric company is completely given free reign. As far as we know, the smart meters were never studied for the safety for humans. It's a, it's a technology done by private companies, these electric companies, the private companies that have the right to install this on your house, destroy your health, and there's no accountability at all for it. So this is just one case. We have many cases where children had recovered from their learning disability, from their autism, from their asthma. Brain cancers had healed. They were non-detectable. The smart meter was installed. Within six months, the brain cancer is back. That was considered healed. The, the seizure disorder was back. The autism was back. Or children, usually the regressive form of autism. Children are born normally after the third or fifth or sixth vaccination when they're 18 months old. Suddenly they have the downturn where they lose what they've gained. They lose their language. They lose eye contact and they're bad. You don't see that with eight-year-olds. But we do. People, children were completely normal, eight year old, in school, everything is good. Suddenly the child turns autistic, loses everything it's gained, including the language. An eight year old, where we find out the smart meter was installed by the house. So this technology is for a lot of people absolutely devastating. We do not know yet whether it's affecting everybody. Just some people notice it and other people just die quietly. <laughs> yeah, we have. There is this myth of electrosensitivity. Electrosensitivity and electroallergy are two different things. Yeah? It is our experience as physicians that everybody is equally electrosensitive. If you install this thing, measurably certain things in your health go down. 
You know, we, we're tracking now, I'll say it here on TV, certain sensitive parameters of it. One is an inflammatory marker called TGF beta 1. It goes way, way up as soon as the smart meter is installed. Uh, the MMP9, that's the metalloproteinases, go way, way up. These are inflammatory markers. The copper level in the serum goes up as a sign of chronic inflammation driven by something that's suddenly there. Um, the hormones go way off. The neurotransmitters go way off. So we have lab tests that we can show. Here's a patient. We monitor him for 10 years before. He was completely normal. The smart meter was installed. Six months later, the patient looks like a dying patient from the lab work. And we find those changes even in people that say, well, my wife is sick since the smart meter is in there, but I'm totally healthy. But we look at the lab work, it looks just as bad. Yeah, so some people have an awareness of health and goodness in them, and other people don't. But from what our experience is that everybody is affected by it. It's not just a few 3% of electrosensitive people. Yeah. And so I think I'd like to make that point here very clear. This is a devastating wrong technology uh, that is, in the first place, completely not serving the purpose under which it's sold to us. It seems to be a marketing tool. It seems to be a, a, a tool you know, to spy on people's homes uh, for advertising purposes. We do not see any positive outcome that anybody has been informed of. You know, yes, you, every time your swimming pool goes on, your electric consumption goes up threefold. There's not the information that the patients get. They just get the general, yes, on Friday you use that much electricity, that's all you can get, but it doesn't give you any of the detail you need to actually be constructive with to reduce your electric consumption. It's not serving that purpose, but it is destroying the health of a lot of people. And of course, for me, the main people that are affected by this is the children, and amongst the children, the unborn children and the fetus. The, the womb concentrates electromagnetic radiation multiple fold above what is measured on the outside of the woman's body. It concentrates the information, the, 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 the concentration of microwave per square meter of the, of the measurement that we do is concentrated on the inside of the womb. The studies are out on this and it's devastating what's coming up towards us. So what's the solution? Um, I, I give you a few things that people have tried. You know, so one is the legal letter that is passed around on the internet that we've tried with the electric companies. There was one positive response where it was deinstalled, several failures. Um, we tried to shield the smart meter towards the house that we put lead lining uh, you know, against the house wall where the smart, between the wall of the house and the smart meter to deflect it from the house. Uh, there usually the consequence is that within a few weeks the electric company says, listen, we're not getting proper readings on your house, we need you to come and look up what's wrong. So there's then a game of hide and seek, you know, where you remove the protection before they come, if you know when they're coming, and then you put it back on. My friends in Germany have found the $20 solution to it, uh, since the smart meter is usually installed outside the home. Uh, my German friends have used what I call the German method, I bought a big axe and smashed the thing because it's on the outside of the house. Nobody can sh prove that it was somebody who lives in the house. And people say, we're terribly sorry, but somebody's doing this. And then as soon as it's reinstalled, they do it again. And the golden rule over there is with the electric companies, if it's done three times, they go back to the old system um, you know, to not lose the, the information or the money. And so I don't know uh, currently technically if there's a better solution out. We are trying as physicians uh, to inform the electric companies, you know, assuming that they themselves don't know this information, that since the smart meter is installed, uh, our patients have high blood pressure peaks. Erratic high blood pressure is the most common uh, symptom that we see, and irregularity of the heart rate of the pulse. You know, those are the first warning signs before the nervous system goes completely off. And so we're writing letters to the electric company and try the peaceful warrior way first, which has worked in some cases and not in others. And so then there's these other stages uh, that we have tried. And I like to say maybe as a conclusion uh, to what I'm saying about, I would say about 80% of health problems that we see now 
are caused or contributed to by the exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields um, that have never been studied for their safety. In fact, all the studies that were done, that were correctly done, show they're not safe. There is frequency bands in the electromagnetic spectrum that could be used in intelligent ways without harming us. There was a beautiful technology out uh, called fiber optics, which was absolutely beautiful and clean and would have done everything that we need the communications industry to achieve. In Western country, it was a beautiful, perfect technology that is now sort of being made redundant with a technology that's devastating to the human health, which I don't understand. You know, we had something good and we replaced it with something far worse. We, we see the same phenomenon worldwide in the Western world, but also now in the Eastern world, you know, where cell phone towers are erected every day. We see the same health problems originating in people. We know cancer rates are going up. There was a famous study in Germany, was the NILA study, that shows, you know, cancer rates in a community where there's no cell phone tower, when there was uh, compared, when you bring the cell phone industry in, for five years there's no increased cancer rates, and after five years it goes up, and after 10 years it's about fourfold, and that has now been confirmed by various other studies. It's just, you know, and of course, this was a study done by friends of mine in a, in a town in Germany called Niele, you know, where the judge ordered that the cell phone industry had to pay for the study. And so it showed the increased cancer rates starting after five years, shooting sharply up. And then, of course, the German government asked the cell phone industry what you want to do about that. And the cell phone industry in Europe said, well, we need to do more studies. And guess how long they did their studies for? <laughs> for four years. They did 10 studies <laughs> paid for by the German government for four years and showed no increase in cancer rates in four years. Well, we knew that before they did that, that there was no increase in cancer rates for four years. But we don't live just for four years, you know. Some of us live even up to 40 or 50, maybe even 80. And so um, it's, a, it's a sad story of our time, you know. My parents had the Second World War and Adolf Hitler to deal with. You know, we have, we have this issue as the big issue of our time. You know, the toxicity issue that was from the 50s to the 90s, and many of us fought the battles on that. I was involved in the... Amalgam War, you know, was called the, the Third Amalgam War, you know, trying to get uh, mercury fillings out of the teeth of people. We were largely successful on those fronts, but sneaking up on us was the communications industry um, using wavelengths and using methods that are unnecessary, unhealthy, dangerous, and are simply driven by greed. They're not driven by any intelligence, you know. And we can have, everybody can have their computer and they can have their cell phone and there is safe ways of doing that, but it's not what we're doing currently. Yeah, so here's, uh, here's something people could do prophylactically. Uh, those of you where the smart meter has not been installed, so typically the way that happens is while you're out at work, the electric company comes and puts a smart meter on the outside of your house. And to prevent that, you can Google the word smart meter lock, where you put a lock around the existing, the place where the smart meter would be installed, and you can put a lock around that so uh, nobody can come and sneak up on you and put it there. And at the same time, you send a registered letter to the utility company, say that you're requesting not to have that installed because there's somebody in the house who is highly electrosensitive, who has been shown to have severe devastating health effects by being exposed to the 900 megahertz wavelength range. And that has been successful. The, the individual differences of people being highly electrosensitive towards, on the other end of the spectrum, people that are less sensitive, is explained by the antenna function of the human body. It's the composition of minerals, the density of minerals, electrolytes, the water content of the system, even the body size. You know, it's been shown that people that have bigger bodies tend to be more electrosensitive. You know, the smaller people are, uh, the less likely they are going on reception to these phenomena. So larger people, funny enough, are more affected than smaller people. So most of the, the most severe electro 
allergic and electrosensitive people that I've seen were large people. And so uh, the primary strategy for us has been for the last 20 years to, to move people out of that, to detox them for heavy metals, to reduce the amount of mercury, lead, nickel, cadmium that's in the bone marrow and in the, in the fascial membranes and in the connective tissue to remove as much of that as possible. And that has been very, very successful as a strategy. And then there's a the part number two, the electric, the shielding of the electric wiring in the body is the myelin sheath around the nerves. And that is greatly, greatly diminished in chronic infections, especially in Lyme disease. You know, there is the, the uh, surface of the Lyme spirochetes has the same surface markers as the myelin. And so when the immune system looks for the Lyme spirochetes, it also attacks your own myelin and nibbles away on it. And so the insulation wears thin in the chronic Lyme patients are the same as electrosensitive people. So if somebody watches this video and you're highly electrosensitive, please have yourself be checked out for Lyme disease. You know, most likely you are positive. The treatment is to first treat the chronic infection successfully, but then is to rebuild the myelin is the second step that needs to be done by giving people, you know, amino acid IVs and, and there's a whole host of other strategies that goes beyond this video to rebuild the myelin, to rebuild the insulation that you naturally have. You know? So it's a three-step uh, protocol. Detox the metals, to reduce the antenna function, to increase the insulation, which is a two-step process by treating chronic infections and then by repairing the myelin. You know? And that has been our strategy. Maybe as a last word, so like a, a technique or a, a, a set of uh, procedures uh, that we do involves also the use of fungal products. You know, the the uh, mushroom extracts have a unique uh, property in protecting people from electrosensitivity. And uh, why that is, we don't know exactly, but we do know that mushrooms thrive in electrically polluted environments, and that was a key for me to figure out, well, how about if we use extracts of those same mushrooms and give them to people, and it's found to be a very, very successful strategy. You know, maitake, shiitake, all the well-known healing mushrooms have a unique place in uh, creating uh, some, some increased ability to tolerate electromagnetic fields in people.